Hi, this is Grandma Lori's Bible Stories, and today, stories of spies, curses, and snakes. First, I want to show you a map of all the places the tribe of Israel went following Moses. You may not know a lot about the world yet, but this shows you a big chunk of Africa. The yellow is Egypt. The red is Canaan, which would become Israel. And you see below it, the giant desert of Arabia. Now, I'll show it to you closer. The black line is the line that showed the Israelites' escape from Egypt over the Red Sea and around the mountain to park and listen to the Lord preach from the mountain. They stayed there a year, and then they moved up the dotted black line until they got to a place called Kadesh. And that's what we're going to cover today. Now the stories. The Israelites stayed in their camp in front of Mount Sinai for almost a year while they were building the tabernacle and learning God's laws through Moses. At last, the cloud over the tabernacle rose up, and the people knew this was the sign for them to move on. So they took down the tabernacle and their own tents and journeyed northward toward the land of Canaan for many days, led by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. At last, they came to a place just on the border between the desert and Canaan, a place called Kadesh. Here they stopped to rest, for there were many springs of water and grass for their animals to eat. They expected very soon to march into the land that would be their home. But first, God spoke to Moses. Send men to spy on the land of Canaan, which I have promised to give to Israel. Have them look around. See what the land is like. Make maps, then come back and tell you what they found. You see, it was smart for the people of Israel to know ahead of time what kind of a land it was. Mountains or plains, green or desert, what fruits and crops grew there. They would need to know about the people who were living there too. Were they big and mean or small and weak? Would the cities be easy to conquer or full of tough warriors? God said, The people who live in these lands have become so wicked that they sacrifice their own babies to idols, and every person does horrible sex sins. They are violent and wicked, so the time has come to get rid of them all, and you men of Israel will be my weapon to destroy them all. The people asked, What? Kill all the people who live there, even the innocent children? Moses explained to them, This is what the Lord has done whenever a city or a land has become too wicked to save. Remember the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember the completely wicked world before the flood? It is for the sake of innocent children that God must wipe out the wicked people and let a better people start over. You children of Israel are God's better people. Since no child can grow up in these lands without them learning to become wicked as well, God will take these children's spirits straight to heaven without any pain. So Moses chose special spies. The 12 men he chose would creep through the land and find the best places to live and to farm. Later, they could guide the tribes to live in the best areas of the land. The spies could figure out clever plans to conquer the wicked cities. These spies needed to be smart, cunning, and brave for such dangerous work as this. Moses chose the smartest, bravest men of high rank among the people, one strong leader from each tribe, 12 in all. One of the men was Joshua, who was Moses' best helper in taking care of the people. He was from the tribe of Joseph, who was sold into Egypt. Another was Caleb, a great young man, who belonged to the tribe of Judah. These 12 men split up into pairs and went out. They traveled through all the lands of Canaan. They looked at the cities, examined the fields, and wrote down what they saw. After 40 days, they came back to Moses' camp. 
While Joshua and Caleb were on the way back, they cut down a massive cluster of ripe grapes, which was so heavy it took both men to carry it between them hanging over a staff. But strangely enough, the spies had both very good and very bad reports. One spy said, We found this a rich land. There is grass for all our flocks, and fields where we can raise grain, and trees bearing fruit, and streams running down the sides of the hills. Another continued to say, But we found the people there are very strong. They are men who love war. They have cities with walls that reach almost up to the sky, and some of the men are giants. The first man agreed. Yeah, giants so tall, we felt like grasshoppers next to them. But Caleb spoke up. Yes, that may be true, but we need not be afraid to go up and take the land. It's a wonderful land, well worth fighting for. God is on our side, and he will help us overcome those cities and their wicked people, even the giant men. The other spies were afraid, saying, no, no, there's no use trying to make war on such strong people. We can never take those walled cities, and we dare not fight the tall giants. Then all the people who had journeyed hundreds of miles from Egypt to find this very land became terrified by the reports of the other ten doubters. They moaned and complained, afraid to go on. Here, on the very border of Canaan, they didn't dare enter it. They forgot all of God's miracles. They were so scared, they cried out against Moses and blamed him for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. They forgot about all their hardships in Egypt, their toil and slavery, and they wanted to go back to Egypt to live. They cried, Let us choose a ruler in place of Moses who has brought on us all this trouble. Find us a man who will take us back to the land of Egypt. But Caleb and Joshua, the two brave spies, said, Why should we fear? The land of Canaan is rich with milk and honey. If God is on our side, we can easily conquer the people who live there. Have you forgotten God's mighty miracles? Let us not rebel against the Lord, nor disobey him and make him our enemy. But when the people heard that, they got so angry, they were ready to stone Joshua, Caleb, and maybe even Moses, and kill them for putting them in danger. At this point, the Lord had had it with these complainers and cowards. He let his glory rise up from the Holy of Holies, fill up the whole tabernacle, and blaze out into the faces of the people. Out of the glory he spoke to Moses, where I'm sure everyone could hear him. How long will this people disobey me and despise me? Such cowards shall not go into this good land that I have promised them. Not one adult shall enter in except Caleb and Joshua, who have been faithful to me. The Lord's voice made the people afraid. They began to weep and wail and try to back away from the Lord's anger and glory. But the Lord spoke on. This is my punishment and my decree for this disobedient people. All of the people who are 20 years old and over 20 shall die here in the desert. But their children shall grow up in this wilderness. They shall grow strong and be obedient. And when they become men, they shall enter in and own the land that I promise to their fathers. You whining people are not worthy of the land that I have been keeping just for you. The people began to cry harder and deny that they had rebelled against Moses and God. We didn't mean it. Give us another chance, Lord. But there would not be another chance for these disobedient, complaining, cowardly people. The Lord said, now turn back into the desert and stay there until you die. After you are dead, Joshua and Caleb shall lead your children into the land of Canaan. Meanwhile, you people shall live in the desert for 40 
years instead of going now into the promised land. Now the people felt even worse than before. They changed their minds as suddenly as they had made up their minds before. No, they all said, we will not go back into the wilderness. We will go straight into Canaan and we will try to conquer it as Joshua and Caleb have said. Moses warned them, no, you must not go into that land for you are not fit to go and God will not go with you. You must turn back into the desert as the Lord has commanded. But these foolish people would not even obey. They rushed up over the mountain and tried to march at once into the nearest land called Kadesh. But they had no leaders. None of the men were trained in warfare. In a confused mob, they rushed upon the people of Kadesh. The people of Kadesh attacked back with all their years of experience in warfare. They killed many Israelites and drove the rest back into the desert. The Israelites, discouraged and beaten, at last obeyed the Lord and Moses and trudged once more back into the desert, following the Holy Tabernacle. And in the desert, on the south of the land of Canaan, the children of Israel wandered round and round for nearly 40 years, and all because they would not trust the Lord. You know, it was no surprise that the Israelites should act like foolish children, eager to go back to Egypt one day and then eager to fight the Canaanites the next day. Because through 400 years, they had been weakened by living as slaves. They hardly knew how to care for themselves and certainly did not know how to survive in battle. In their hearts, they were still slavish and weak. God showed Moses that they and their children needed to have a free life in the wilderness, even if it was a very hard life. Their children, growing up as free men, began to be trained for war. Those bold children would be better fit to win the land of promise than their fathers would have been. The young men grew up to learn the skills of soldiers with bows and spears and slings and swords. During these years, one by one, the old people died off. In time, Moses' sister Miriam and his brother Aaron died too. The high priesthood was then given to Aaron's son, Eleazar. But even after the 40 years, they saw that the Canaanites and Amorites who lived nearby were still too strong for them. So they sought a different road into Canaan. Instead of going straight into Canaan, they went way up around the side. It was a long, hard journey through a deep valley, which was very hot. And for most of the journey, they were going away from Canaan, not toward it but it was their only choice. Moses would not let them fight the men of Edom or Moab, who were their relatives through Abraham and his first son Ishmael. While Israel marched on this long journey, the people began to curse Moses again. They said, Why have you brought us into this hot, sandy country? There's no water and there's no bread except for this yucky manna. We're sick to death of manna for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Another called out, We wish we were all back in Egypt again. We had all kinds of things to eat and drink and plenty of water for our animals. Their constant complaining made God angry at the people. So he sent them a very strange lesson, a lesson that would teach many of them obedience and faith. God suddenly allowed thousands of poisonous snakes to crawl into the camp of Israel. Those snakes slithered along the people and bit them. These snakes were called fiery serpents because their poisonous bite felt like fire. Their eyes and flickering tongues seemed to flash out fire. Their bite caused people's flesh to swell up and burn like the devil. Many of the people died. 
They cried out to Moses for help. They were perfectly aware that they were being punished for speaking against Moses again. They knew that when they spoke against Moses, they were speaking against God who was leading them. That made them weep pitifully. We have sinned against the Lord. We're sorry. Truly, we're so sorry. Save us, Moses. Save us. Many cried, Moses, pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed again for these rebellious people as he had prayed so many times before. God heard Moses' prayer and said, Moses, cast a serpent out of brass that looks like these fiery serpents in the camp. Set it high up on a pole where people can see it. Then tell everyone who gets bitten to look at the serpent on the pole and he shall live. Here's one artist's picture of what this serpent on a pole looked like. And Moses is saying, just look at it. Just look at it and you will be healed. Moses did as God commanded him, made the serpent of brass, which looked like a fiery snake, and fastened it to a tall pole. He lifted it way up high where everyone could see it. Then Moses cried out to the people, Come closer, my people. Come and look at the brass snake and you will live. So anyone who had been bitten by a snake could crawl or stagger to where he or she could look at the brass snake. Quickly, their bite stopped swelling and hurting, and the bite did not kill them. But here's something the people did not know. This brass snake lifted high was a symbol of Jesus Christ, even though it was shown long, long before Christ came. Centuries later, Jesus told the people of his own time, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him may have eternal life. So I'll bet you think that all the people rushed to Moses to look up at the brass snake and be cured. Nope. Just like doubters today, many of them said, That's just stupid. How can I be healed of snake bite just by looking at some dumb brass snake? Huh. Moses says so, but I don't believe him. Besides, I hurt too bad to go look at a dumb snake. I'll just stay right here and die. <laughs> and guess what? That's exactly what hundreds of Israelites did. They stayed right where they were when they got bitten, and they died. They would not even turn around and look. After all the miracles from God that Moses had shown them, too many men and women refused to even turn around and look. Can you see the comparison of the snake on the pole with Christ raised up on the cross? People bitten by the fiery snakes could look at Moses' brass snake and be healed. Also, sinners, when they look upon the crucified Christ and believe, they shall live. All we have to do is look to Christ on the cross, learn of him, follow him, obey, and we will not die to God. We will live in heaven with Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father and all of our dearest loved ones and be happy forever. Christ.